Now, the good thing about having the struggle of an HBCU is, especially for me, it helped me grow up, but it also helped yes. me build my relationships because when I couldn't get something done, I had to go communicate with someone. Mm -hmm. And that led to my quick independency, mm -hmm. my quick maturity, but ultimately my communication skills and my relationship building. All right, Nika, yes. Ray and Donovan, <laughs> thank you for doing some truthing with Randy V. You know, I believe that black people are oftentimes muzzled, that our voices or how we feel, our opinions are diluted because we live in a majority culture. When we talk about how we really feel, sometimes we get in some way punished. And, and so I, I hate for that to happen. I think it's healthy for us, cathartic, to do some truthing. So that's what we're gonna do today. I picked uh, a question out of the truthing cards and this is today's question. Do you think that HBCUs have the same importance and value currently as they've had in prior eras? So I'll start. I think their value is more important today than in the past. Wow. But I think they're undervalued. Mm, okay, speak on it. So, in today's culture and society, most of the HBCUs, it's imperative that they get state or federal government funding. So they get away from the historical foundation that got them where they are today. And in that case, they need us more because everybody knows that the enrollment rate in probably 90% of HBCUs are down. Um, or the retaining of students is down. Well, you know what's up? If we can't thank Trump for anything else. Well, over the last uh, yeah, year and yeah, a half. Yeah, the over the last no, year No, like half. the last six, seven yeah. years, they are exploding. Record numbers, thanks to uh, Trump. Well, you and me, that's a struggle. I and think. that's my home school. Mm -hmm. And so uh, ultimately this year, it has gone up this year. Um, but the HBCUs really need to get back to the foundations of black people and black organizations that got them to where they are. So that's just my... My but you think they're it. needed more today? Oh, Would you agree, Donovan, that they're needed more today than they were decades ago? I agree that they're needed more now today. But why? Um, and, and the reason why is because I see more students who, you know, working in K-12 education, I see more students who don't know who they are. Mm. They don't know where they came from. I know when I went to HBCU in the 90s, you know, my mom and dad had instilled in me, you know, my blackness, who I was, who I can be, who, where I come from. And so I think that that's one of the real reasons why we need them, but also the value of it for a long time, a, a number of black people were not introducing and in pushing their students to go to HBCUs. And now some of it is, oh, it's the popular thing. It's on TikTok. It's on, um, oh, I want to be uh, vice a &T president. Mom. We have a vice, yeah, the president, vice president that went to HBCU. So, and so some now of it is for that clout, yes. you know, but there's real work that is done out of HBCUs. I think that um, it's more popular now than back when we were going to school because a lot of um, students, black students, want to see more of them in um, in the different sectors of the business world, in the educational world, in the gaming world. They want to see more of themselves. So I think that's why, um, you know, black students want to go to an HBCU because they're now seeing the value of themselves. And now they're also seeing that they want to, this is where I can find my appreciation in myself is through going to an HBCU. And do you think it's fear too? I mean, as I mean, after, you know, when we saw George Floyd being murdered, and of yeah. course we've seen a lot of murders before then, George Floyd was the most popular, um, not most known, I shouldn't say popular. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's a fear? Because I know for me, when I was sending my sons to college, I had to think very carefully, where do I feel where I can sleep at night knowing that my two black boys are in a town that's, that's a way for me. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think there's a big fear with where the country is today in dealing uh -huh. with that. So ultimately as parents, we, we, we want to feel comfortable where our kids are, but also the kids want to go somewhere where people look like them. 
-hmm. and they have that comfort of being around people that look like them. Um, so I agree with you 100%. It's a, it's a matter of comfort for parents and the students, definitely. And for a lot of students who've been through the American education system, they constantly have seen more white teachers. They've probably encountered more mm -hmm. white teachers than they have black. And then you go to an HBCU and you're like, wow, I got this teacher's yes. black and that professor's black. So it also helps you attain your goal because if I got a, an engineering professor who's black and you know maybe they came from a, a area like mine, disenfranchised, and they, they can tell me their story and connect with me, they can teach me differently, you know, more culturally responsive. So I think the value also goes back to that. I think, um, well, let's go back to when my son, um, when Trump was in office, um, my son, he was, he swore me down. He's like, I'm not going to an HBCU. I'm going to a PWI. He plays tennis. Mm. Um, so that was one of the reasons why, you know, black colleges normally don't perform well in tennis, mm -hmm. except for FAMU when they did have a tennis team. Um, however, with the climate that was going, you know, the, the, the violence that was going on with black men at the time, he started to change his perception and like, nah, I think I need to go to a um, HBCU because I'll be more protected. And yeah. I'm thankful that he made that decision because I became scared myself. I was like, no, I need you to go to a school where you're, you're, you're being nurtured, where you're safe where I know when I lay my I head mean, down. safe, yeah. Exactly. Um, you know, you're not being, you know, set up somewhere in the woods. You because know? do you remember, It was because our sons went to Hampton about the same time. Right. There was um, t like two occasions where it was either, one at Harvard and one at Yale, where mm -hmm. black students were harassed in the study center. Like, yes. why are you here? Yeah, yeah. We need do to you see belong? your, do you belong here? Mm -hmm. And you know, that, that feeling of always having to justify your existence, yeah. right? To me is almost like a violent act where mm -hmm. I feel like I have to tell people, no, I deserve to be here. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, okay, but let me ask you this. We're saying that they're more relevant, but have our HBCUs. And I know that we love our HBCUs. Mm -hmm. We talked about that before. You're not Tuskegee, yeah. you know, all the love. Um, but ha are we, have we prepared ourselves? I mean, have we, uh, moved on? Are we, have we grown? Are we still kind of stuck in some own traditions and old ways? You mean as the HBCU? Yeah, as the, the, H, as the, system, the HBCU. The system of the HBCU. Yes, yeah. like we want yes. them, but have they met the time? Absolutely. No. They're, still in, they're still in the past. Yeah, well, we're still stuck. They're still yeah, in the past. The kids still got to go to yeah. the financial aid line. Okay? They <laughs> they're not doing it online. They still go to the <laughs> financial aid page. We're still yeah. having dorm problems and exactly. water problems. Okay. Okay. And listen, I pay, protesting. Yes. I still paid my uh, son's uh, thing with the money order. I didn't okay. even know where to get a money okay. order back in the day. Because they don't take a credit card. They don't take credit cards. And I'm like, come on now. So I was like, but what? Okay, okay. So first of all, we're agreeing that no, we are we have not progressed. Absolutely. Right. Right. Why? Because we have old people in those positions. <laughs> well, yes. she said it. You okay. said it. Let's not hold back. Let's do some truth. Yeah. Like, you got to be real about it. And when you when you um, bring it to their attention, well, that's the way we've been doing it, and that's the problem. I always tell people the worst reasoning for doing anything is that's the way we've always done it. That exactly. is the worst reason to say why mm -hmm. you're doing something. I would say in addition to old people, there's old systems. So it could be a young person there, but whoever's in charge of the system and the decision making of the system does not want to change the system to accommodate the innovative thinkers that we have. Why don't they want to change it? I, I'm not sure about that. Some of it is that's not what they're used to doing and it would cause them to have to grow and change and learn that's something new. See, I'm going right. to say power. I'm going to say mm. one thing that makes me yeah. sad Keep about our black organizations is we as a people so rarely get in positions of power mm. and that when we get it, we almost don't want to share it. We don't want to be uncomfortable with it. We will, you know, if we are that person who was running the financial aid and been doing it that way since forever, mm -hmm. It would make us vulnerable if we yeah. then said, no, we have to move to a, a, a faster system, mm -hmm. a more efficient system. You make right? a good point, though, about power. Right. And so the HBCU is almost like a mom or dad. It's the parent of the children. Yeah. Yes. For us as parents of, of young adults, we know that the way we parented our kids yesterday, we can't do the same for them as young adults. We have to change. Lord knows I tried. They, yes. <laughs> I and, tried and to try, say some of the things my mama and daddy said, system, and they right? looked at me like this. It does not like work. That because I said so don't work. It don't no. work the yeah. same. Yeah, have to give but, reasons. But we realize that, right? Mm -hmm. The institution at the universities have not realized that. 
They have. They don't want to change. They don't. We have change. young people um, that do things differently than we did it, mm-hmm. than they did it. Um, again, I think you made a great point. We do have new majors um, and, and new schools, but the way about doing business has not changed. Mm-mm. Yeah, I have an 11th grader and um you know i've always taught my children my two daughters you go into an hbcu no question hands down don't even play with me and um you know my youngest is hell bent on everything that comes in the mail look mom usc is looking at me look mom this is so she really wants to go to a pwi i am not uh comfortable with that because i don't know how to maneuver that system and how to support her through that Mm -hmm. but i'm also concerned what you guys said about the safety but then she wants to do some like bioengineering and computer right. stuff. They have those programs right. there. I can't find an HBCU that has both of what she wants. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so I don't know where we're going to land. Just pray for us. No, I, I can really relate to that because my youngest son and actually may be transferring to a PWI. And I told them before they went. Like the struggle is real. Mm -hmm. So I said, when you come home for Christmas and you're hanging out with your friends, because we lived in a very white area Mm -hmm. and they say, hold on one second. They press on their phones and you find out they register for classes. Right. (laughs) You're going to be frustrated because that's not how it is at at an HBCU. Mm -hmm. It it takes some time and it is the struggle is real. Right. And so you do get if you if you are used to certain accommodations and things work in a certain way, it makes it real tough to then go to 1952. Yeah, (laughs) it was um, a shocker um, because my son went to a um, white high school Mm -hmm. and he, he when he got to Hampton, it was like, what do these black folks do here <laughs> right. in this office? Right. So I think there is a little bit of laziness as well. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, because every time um, my mother wants to speak to the president about money at Hampton, because mm-hmm. she was the finance person on, you know, making sure that his funds went through, um, she would call the president's office and get them on the phone and tell them, hey, I'm trying to speak to such and such in the financial aid office. Guess what? They're not answering. Right. What no, are they doing? Don't it will not answer the phone. But sometimes. guess what? I'm standing right there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're not answering the phones. Mm-hmm. That's why I had to get my mother on the phone to get to the president to say, hey, they're not answering. And guess what? When they saw that number pop up in financial aid, guess what? They would answer that phone exactly. because it was coming from the president. But I think office. that comes from HBCUs used to be a grow your own type of institution mm-hmm. where, you know, for example, uh, you know, being from Howard University, our last president, President Frederick, we called him a son of Howard. Yes. He went mm-hmm. through the process. He right. understood, exactly. you know, and so now we have a large number of leaders of HBCUs who they don't they come. They see what the other people see, the TikTok and the video, but they don't really get our culture mm-hmm. and understand why we do what we do. Mm-hmm. And then they make changes that can be um, detrimental to the culture and the history of the mm-hmm. HBCU. But one of the things you just said, he's the son of Howard, right? Mm-hmm. So he's a graduate of an HBCU. Right. The other issue is he most of it. the administrators right. are not graduates of HBCUs. They are graduates right. of PWI. And it's a very distinct real culture. Yeah. If you don't, it get, it, you don't get you don't it, you don't get right. it. And so when yeah. these folks come in, they don't understand the changes that need to be made. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They just don't. Now, the good thing about having the struggle of an HBCU is, especially for me, it helped me grow up but it also helped me build my relationships because when I couldn't get something done, I had to go communicate with someone. Mm -hmm. And that led to my quick independency, Mm -hmm. my quick maturity, but ultimately my communication skills and my relationship building. And so when we send our children or other kids to HBCUs, we know the realization of, of it being a struggle to do whatever. But I am appreciative of, of that struggle. Just like yeah. you yeah. said, yeah. 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 brag about it. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And guess what? It makes us so much stronger. It does. Uh, it prepares us for this world. Yep. Without, exactly. Without UMES or Morgan State, I have no clue where I would be. Same. And, Absolutely. And again, also but at the, the same time, I do want us to progress. Yes, we need right? to progress. Absolutely. And, and, and I'm because con- I think there's a couple reasons that we don't. I think another reason is because, you know, a lot of our schools are on land grants. I mean, I don't know what the stat is, but it's something like 85 percent of our schools are in uh, Wi-Fi deserts, mm-hmm. like where oh, they were yes. placed because we were given the worst. Right. Yes. We were given these schools in the worst places. But that also does limit the amount, the, the number of people who will come and work there, yeah. mm-hmm. right? Because for someone to come and work at Tuskegee University, for instance, right. you have to live in Tuskegee, Alabama, wow. most likely. Right. And if I am a Harvard graduate or whatever, or even if I was, you know, went through Tuskegee and then all HBCUs, that's a major sacrifice to live in a town that does not 
even have a Walmart right, right. now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. That's serious. And that's a level of dedication. Mm -hmm. So are you getting the people who are ready to push it forward and who are excited about that? Yeah. You know, sometimes. As you talk about innovation of our HBCUs, one of the things I've been on since about 2016 is, you know, I don't think they're using their campuses to the full um, potential. For example, you have your PWIs and um, your HSIs, your Hispanic serving institutions, and they do like online classes. They were doing this before the pandemic. Yes. It took the pandemic for us to even attempt online. Yes. And we returned back to in-person because a large number of our faculty at HBCUs are you know, older and they were not comfortable with the software right. and the maneuvers mm -hmm. and they got away from it. But these other institutions are keeping both, you know, and so they're making money without having to have space in dorms, you know, but we still hanging on that. We got to have them in person because that's what the professors want. You just said something powerful, though. I don't like because you said they're thinking about double ways they can make money mm. because HBCUs are like our hearts like it's a it's a it's a it's not about money i, I think that we're there for such different reasons it's it's mm. it's a, a institution of love it's it's our family and so maybe we don't push as hard because what you push hard when something's about money right? right when you're thinking you're innovating when you're like i gotta make some money it's right. i always told people it's the difference of when i was working for private industry versus government when mm -hmm. when the drive is money is different right. right and so i also wonder if that slows us down i never thought of that before but mm -hmm. i just wonder if because that's a re one of the reasons why we just kind of like we just love it we're just here we're not really so much thinking about how do we progress and get better better and better we need to. Yes, Lord. Yeah. We need to. It's imperative. And we, we need to. presidents in these positions so that they can get us. I think um, Frederick, our president at Howard, um, I think he does a good job of doing that. He just started, right? Yes. Well, no, he, no, he, he just retired. There. Yeah, he just I mean, he just retired. retired. Yeah. You have a new yeah. person. Have a new president who started in September. Yeah. Okay. I think he did a wonderful job in um, progressing us just a, a tad bit more. So is the new him. president a, a graduate of an HBCU? No, he is mm -hmm. not. That's a problem. Well, you have to also look at the pool of eligible candidates. Exactly. That's true too. You know, everybody doesn't want to uh, come to an HBCU mm -hmm. and um, deal with some of the, the, the systemic problems that they're going to be faced with. Um, and HBCU alumni, you know, they, they don't play. You know, yep. and at a PWI, you may not have them at that level. Mm -hmm. well, 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 what do you think when you say they don't play? What do you think about uh, Deion Sanders? And he worked for HBCU and he kind of has complained about it and people have become defensive. You know, he was at Jackson State. Mm -hmm. um, I think he's thought? saying what we were sitting here, just saying the same thing. He sees the value in it. Mm -hmm. He wanted to support and be a part of that, but he also was like, here's some changes you need to make. Right. So, you know, when people, when you come in the house and you tell somebody, you know, I like it, but you know, your kitchen kind of old, you need to update your appliances. <laughs> right. They don't want to hear that. Right. You know, exactly. you're hurting somebody's feelings. And then in addition to that, they did upgrade the facility and the locker room. But uh, he was also saying that integrity played a role in him leaving as well, because exactly. from what he said, they promised him something or some additional changes and some of the proceeds from the ticket sales, which being Deion Sanders, he brought people out he to see. certainly did. And once they reneged on what he said they promised on, that's a, a, a breach of contract. Right. Right. And so financially, regardless of how much money he has, or we think he has, he still has to support his family. He's owed a salary mm -hmm. for, for doing a job. And so if they breach that contract, the level of respect and integrity goes out the window. So he was like, I'm gone. You know, and that's just based on what he said. Um, so what ultimately, is it great to have people like Dion come back to HBCUs? Absolutely. No, we need. We no, it, it's not even great. We need. I, right. I was yeah. so, you don't yes. understand when he came. Because I said, what if one day our black players mm -hmm. played for an HBCU? And because yes. that's where the money comes from. Yeah. If you yeah. look at, if you look at, um, like, like um, all the major schools, it's the football and basketball teams that pays for crew, mm -hmm. that pays for research. I mean, yeah. that is the bread and butter Absolutely. of organizations. I said, so if we were to take that and our kids started coming to our schools, then we could, you know, improve everything. But look at Bethune Cookman with Ed Reed. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and I don't know if y'all saw the pictures and the videos of the practice field that they were on. It was a sandlot. Yes. It was a sandlot. Mm -hmm. And they were not willing. I mean, that's Ed Reed, a Hall of Famer. Right. Yeah who's gonna bring people to your stadium and bring kids that are interested in football to that university and give them that pipeline and, and that tangible connection with NFL players. And they were not willing to make the changes 
that he needed them well, to make. Not willing to make the changes and also angry that Ed Reed and uh, Dion. Dion, Dion spoke openly about the issues, and they, which is another thing which that I think exists in our community. Yeah. You don't talk about, you don't tell your business outside the house, house now. Days 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 the house. House. But I'm glad they did. It, yeah. it, it needed to happen on that celebrity level yeah. because they're not going to listen. listen to us. No, they're not. Regular voices. Um, it's good that these celebrities are now bringing that attention. And I think, you know, the numbers went up a little bit in um, attendance as far as these athletes are concerned. So I think it was a good thing. Yeah. That, in the long um, run, yes. That they, you know, spoke out. I say, hey, continue to bring those celebrities in. Let them and Jackson but I, State attendance is still up now. Yep. Yeah, it is yeah. still up. Yeah. And, 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 and but I hope that they will make the changes because yeah. people are live it because mm -hmm. they put voice to it and that is something within our community that we i mean that is a strict thing you do not talk about what's happening within the house particularly mm -hmm. in mixed company right. so because they have right. the media involved right everybody now deal, knows yeah. the issues mm -hmm. and it's a big we deal. talk about those issues amongst ourselves yes but you know we don't take but it how do you there. fix them if you don't talk about it? well the right. other thing is that probably is that underlying question when there's an increase in profit, where is that money going? Yeah, and people that's need to ask. People, mm -hmm. That should be transparent to the alumnus, mm -hmm. you know, and the people at the university. We have an increase of profit. What are we going to do with that profit? How are we going to help the university with that increased profit? Yeah. You're going to fix that. I know because, like, you know, like the Commodores went to Tuskegee and he had given a bunch of money, I heard, but he wanted to use for, like, the music center and they didn't use it for that. Exactly. You know, I learned that you cannot tell these colleges, what you want to use the money for, right. like specifically. That's what I learned. You mean HBCUs? You mean yes. Because white colleges, yes. they do all I'm the time. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Right. I'm sorry, yes. PWIs, right. you tell them where you want your money to go and mm -hmm. it happens. And yes. it goes. Um, but again, if, if if they're receiving donation, I think it's, they, they should listen to the voices of the people giving them the donation. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, you have no choice. If I'm gonna give you my $5 million, yeah, I'm gonna tell I want to see where my $5 million is. Yeah, the Randy B school or whatever. Exactly. That's what I want to see. I, if I give you $5 <laughs> million. Look, look, the way that, if I give you 500, I want, exactly. you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, come right. on now. Yeah, you want $40 over here, yeah, 20 over exactly. there. <laughs> I wonder what the problem is. So what? when I was a, a alumni president um, for one of our organizations, it's basically like they don't want one side to get more than the other. So, for example, what if we were the pharmacy alumni club and we raise all this money and only pharmacy got scholarships like that. But the other majors, the business majors don't have those same opportunities. So they're trying to spread the wealth where across the campus where it's needed. And so, you know, what I say is maybe you have to do your own thing and keep your scholarship outside of the institution and give it to the students that you deem it But we can't for. progress that. But you know what, exactly. now that you say scholarships, why do we give so little? You know, our, our, our giving back oh at, at, at schools mm -hmm. is low. Yes. And I don't know anyone who loves their schools more than HBCU graduates. I think it's the idea of not knowing where your money's gonna go. Mm. That transparency is not there. Right. And I, I think that most people that graduate from HBCUs have no problem giving back. I know us, all of us being in, in Greek organizations, our organizations give back to the school. Mm -hmm. You know, my chapter gives back to UMES mm -hmm. and through our endowment fund. I'm sure right. your chapters give back. Right. And we have a say in where that money goes to a certain degree. As alumnus, most of them just don't know where that money's gonna go or they don't see any progression as we talked about earlier. You know, with all these schools having issues with the dorms and facilities, and you know everybody in our media circle just our circle we know are giving back so we assume that it's a whole bunch of other circles that are giving back they're not but where's the money going but also i don't think that we fundraise well i mean i don't i don't it's, it's not an aggressive effort to me to get mm -hmm. money back not just fundraise well working at a uh, pwi and attending one one thing they do there is they kind of train the current students so that when they graduate, they know the expectation. And when I was at an HBCU as an undergraduate, nobody taught me like when you're done, you should be giving, putting aside $20 for this, that, and the third and give Very back. Real. So what I see from my, my uh, I went also went to George Washington University and there's a little student that calls me every uh, semester till they graduate and they say, hey, I'm in the school that you were in and I'm majoring in what you majored in. Right. And if you could give mm. back this amount, this is our goal for the year. And I say, I can't give that. And they'll say, they get all the way down to $5. They will take that $5. They will take that $5. But see the HBCU? Yeah. We need 
fifteen hundred dollars. <laughs> we need it by Friday. <laughs> and if you don't have it, they'd be like, Well, that's good. You right. know, they gotta they gotta kinda do like church did. You know, we yeah. just need the building fund to continue to that's grow so we can pay off the mortgage. That's the but problem. You get that building fund we get it though. The pastor for gonna take years. your five dollars. They can take your same building There you go. Years. So fifty so, fifty your building fund. <laughs> so uh, we started out with saying we've all agreed that HBCUs are still very needed, very relevant now. Absolutely. Um, just as they were more so, as you're saying, some of you said more so. Mm -hmm. Just give me one reason why, while we wrap this up. Why? Why is it so needed? Why is it more relevant? Because we, we, we've said the problems. Why do people need to consider HBCUs? Because no one else is going to expose you to yourself like an HBCU. I'll say because Black Lives Matter and our future mm. is at stake. Mm. So there has to be a place for our children so they can do better, be better, live better. Live that better. part. I think the level of comfort, their necessity, because it's nothing wrong with kids wanting to be around kids that look like them. And they provide that opportunity for black and brown kids to grow and learn around black and brown kids. And they need a space where they can do that. I agree with all of what you said. For me, it's the same um, reason as it's always been. I want black children to absolutely love themselves. I feel that there's so many messages that tell them that they're unworthy. And that there's something magical that happens that we all experience when you're on a campus that everybody looks at you and sees possibility. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, I appreciate you all for truthing with me today as we talk about these HBCUs. And, you know, I pray for all of them, to, uh, for us to elevate yeah. to the demands. There's a high demand for them these yes. days. Yes. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you.